For most visitors of historic Huguenot Street, the famous Du Bois Fort is the first historic building they get to explore upon arrival. With over three centuries of history, the Du Bois Fort has functioned as a colonial homestead, a boarding house, a tea room, and even a popular restaurant. Despite its ever-changing identity, the fort has always been an important community gathering place in New Paltz, which is why its current function as Historic Huguenot Street's Visitor Center might be the building's most fitting identity to date. Since its construction circa 1705, the Du Bois Fort has gained not only a vast amount of history, but it's also become known for its fascinating folklore. Du Bois family oral histories, tales of ghostly apparitions, and legends of secret tunnels have drawn countless visitors to investigate the mysteries hidden within its stone walls. Hello everyone, my name is Amber Nielsen and I am the Arts and Interpretation Manager at Historic Huguenot Street. This is part one of a two-part video series about the Du Bois Fort, so make sure you tune in for part two. Now let's dig into the legacy of this historic building and explore what's fact, what's folklore, and what's hmm, somewhere in between. The New York State Historic Marker outside of the fort says the following, built in 1705 by Daniel Du Bois, site of the first readout. There are portholes in the East End. Based on what we currently know, this information checks out, but there's a lot of history packed in there, all of which is tied to some interesting folklore, so let's go through it piece by piece. Daniel Du Bois was the grandson of Louis Du Bois, one of the French Huguenot patentees or founders of New Paltz, New York, who signed the 1677 land patent to acquire 40,000 acres of land from the Esopus Muncie Native Americans with approval from the English governor, Sir Edmund Andros. Are you still with me? Good. Now, Louis Du Bois, as one of the New Paltz founders, has quite the legacy of his own. As a patentee, or person who signed the land patent, Louis Du Bois wielded great power and influence over the early New Paltz community. And by then, he'd already been known as somewhat of a hero among the European colonists in the area due to his involvement in the Second Esopus War. Prior to the 1677 land agreement, rising tensions between the Esopus Muncie people and the Dutch and French colonists in the Mid-Hudson Valley resulted in two major conflicts, now referred to as the Esopus Wars. During the Second War in 1663, members of the Esopus Muncie tribe took several women and children captive from the Dutch town of Wiltwick, known today as Kingston, New York. The capture of these women and children is believed to be an act of retaliation on the Dutch for taking several of the natives and selling them into slavery. After a violent battle in Wiltwick, the Esopus held the colonists as prisoners for three months. Among the women taken was Catherine Blanchon, the wife of Louis Du Bois. Louis supposedly helped lead the search party to find Catherine and the others. While we know this much of the story to be true, Many strange variations of the captive's release have surfaced over the years and are often mistaken as fact. Interestingly, most of these legends seem to revolve around Catherine Blanchon. Like a game of telephone. <sighs> hey, can I call you back? I'm making a video. A video. No, not a tornado, a video. Like a game of telephone, the nature of oral history is that the story can change as it's passed from person to person. It's unfortunate in the sense that we don't know exactly what occurred during this captivity. However, we do have several stories because of it. Here are a few of the more bizarre versions of the story. When the search party arrived to rescue the captives from the Esopus, the tribe was about to burn the women and children at the stake. Then suddenly, Catherine began to sing Psalm 137. By the river of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. But she probably would have sang it in French. Anyway, it apparently pleased the Esopus so much that they decided to put their torches down and let everyone free. In reality, burning at the stake was almost never a native custom, so that likely extinguishes any truth to that version. Another version tells a different tale, 
where the search party surprises the Asopus, and many of those involved, including the captives, go running for the hills. One account states that Louis Du Bois had to tell his wife Catherine to stop so he wouldn't shoot her in the chaos. Another account recalls a different perspective, in which Louis had to tell Catherine to stop or I'll shoot you as she was running away from him. <laughs> This version suggests that Catherine may not have actually wanted to return to her life in the colonial village. In any case, Catherine and her children were uh, rescued and returned home. Despite her capture happening 42 years before the Du Bois fort was built, the story of Catherine Blanchin has become synonymous with the building's history. There may even be a link between the story of Catherine's plight and the misinformation spread over the years about whether or not the Du Bois fort was ever actually, well, a fort. Which takes us back to our New York State historic marker. There are portholes in the East End. More often referred to as the gun ports, this feature is among the first things visitors look for when stopping by the visitor center. These gun ports have helped perpetuate the popular local tradition that the Du Bois homestead also acted as the community's fortification in compliance with Governor Andros' order for the colonists to build a place for retreat and safeguard, especially in the case of Native American conflict. And to tell you the truth, staff, longtime volunteers, and even local historic preservationists have gone back and forth for years trying to decide whether or not these gun ports are authentic or not. Currently, the thought is yes, they are authentic to the building. It is more likely, though, that they were only installed by Daniel Du Bois for his own personal safety, and he likely never even used them. But because there are gun ports in the East Wall, oral histories passed down through the generations have attributed the fort title to the Du Bois homestead. In reality, the so-called redoubt that the historic marker refers to was a large wooden stockade that once stood on the lawn right in front of where the Du Bois house now sits. Historic Huguenot Street recently commissioned a historical painting by artist and architect Len Tantillo, which you can see here, that depicts the newly founded New Paltz landscape circa 1685 with what we imagine the original redoubt looked like based on archaeological findings. No other historic houses still standing on Huguenot Street have evidence of gun ports in their walls, so perhaps Daniel Du Bois couldn't shake the story of his grandmother captures Catherine. Catherine's capture. Grandma Catherine's capture. Okay. His grandma captions Cath. Maybe Daniel Du Bois thought about his grandma while he was building his house, and he chose to be safe rather than sorry, and added in a couple gun ports that he never used and would confuse people for 300 years. In any case, the Du Bois Fort gun ports will likely remain somewhat of a mystery. That's all for this week. So be sure to tune in for part two of Facts and Folklore of the Du Bois Fort to discover more mysteries on Huguenot Street, including tales of a secret tunnel, paranormal activity, and a chilling archival document written by a child dated 1902. Thanks for watching.